Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to see so many people joining us this evening. I'm thrilled to have Carol Mull here with us um, to talk about the Underground Railroad history here in Michigan and with some of our Washtenaw County Park sites. Um, Carol Mall is author, lecturer, and scholar of the Underground Railroad history in Michigan, and was also a founding member and past chair of the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. Um, when most people think about Washtenaw County Parks sites, I know you typically think of trails and recreation and some of the, the pictures kind of behind me here, um, but there's a deep history with a couple of our sites that Carol will talk about today. Um, one of those being Watkins Lake State Park and County Preserve. Um, and in 2020, that was awarded a membership to the Network to Freedom Program um, through the National Park Service. And this was due to a lot of the work and history that um, Carol had done. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Carol. Um, she'll have a presentation and at the end, um, we'll have some time for some uh, questions and answers. And so um, there should be a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to type in your questions and we'll field some of those questions at the end. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here to share this history with you. Um, thank you to the Washtenaw County Parks and Recreation Department for asking me to come here to talk. And um, thank you to all of you out there who have Zoomed in to listen. I appreciate your interest and I hope this inspires you to learn even more about um, our Underground Railroad history uh, in this area. Um, let's get started. Um, in 1830, of 14 million people in America, 2 million men, women, and children were held in chattel slavery. Those escaping bondage found little assistance beyond the slave quarters in the South and the scattered African-American communities in the North. Some early pioneers in Michigan were opposed to slavery and offered shelter and aid to freedom seekers. Amasa Gillett, founder of Sharon Mills, was an active abolitionist. When Joseph Mallory freed himself, Amasa Gillett offered him sanctuary. A decade later, John Felix White found help fleeing Kentucky through underground railroad networks. He reached Southeast Michigan and worked on the farm of Royal and Sally Watkins when he was nearly abducted back into slavery. This presentation will highlight these two stories and their connections to Sharon Mills and Watkins Lake State Park and County Preserve, both affiliated with the Washtenaw County Parks and Recreation Department. All right, working on getting to the next slide. <laughs> this. All right, well, while we're working on this, I can go ahead and talk. Um, so I'm gonna give a little context for these events. Here we go. The Northwest Ordinance, <clears throat> I see my face is right on top of that. Um, the Northwest Ordinance prohibited legal slavery in the Great Lakes territories, but race-based slavery was upheld by English, French, Canadian, and American settlers up to the 1830s. States in the North were phasing out slavery in the early 1800s, while America's South cemented 
regulations for African Americans to endure inheritable lifetime bondage. As you can see on the map, Michigan was mostly a wilderness. The Erie Canal opening in 1825 brought a wave of New Englanders, and some of them were fervent abolitionists. By 1838, Michigan had achieved statehood. Across the Detroit River, the British Canadian provinces basically outlawed slavery, creating a safe place for self-freed and free people of color. Anti-slavery men and women formed organizations to end slavery in America and help African-Americans in their communities. Initially, little assistance reached those held in chattel slavery in slaveholding states. Joseph Mallory escaped bondage in Augusta, Georgia, relying on his own wits and determination. Imagine how difficult it was to travel on foot through swamps, across rivers, never knowing who to trust for directions or food. Many were caught, returned to slavery, and severely punished or hanged. Mallory was on foot, as far as we know, for eight months. He found help in Northern Indiana, with J Josiah Osborne, who then sent Mallory from the Cass County area in Western Michigan to Schoolcraft. In Schoolcraft, Dr. Nathan Thomas <clears throat> was a strong anti-slavery advocate. And he wrote later of helping around a thousand people on their journey to freedom. This is, as you see on the screen, um, what he wrote in later years about his experiences. And he mentioned sending Mallory from his home to the home of William Sullivan in Jackson County, and then Sullivan sending Mallory to, as you can see here on the screen, Old Father Gillett in Sharon Township, Washtenaw County. This is the original writing about the event and a picture of Thomas's home in Schoolcraft, Michigan. William Sullivan was an active anti-slavery man who published the first anti-slavery newspaper in Michigan. It didn't last, but was soon replaced with a signal of liberty. As you can see in this article, a mass Gillett was named as helping to found and becoming the president of the Michigan Wesleyan Anti-Slavery Society. Wesleyans left their religious organizations because they chose to actively protest slavery and they refused to be members of churches that included slaveholders. Also, <clears throat> Laura Smith Havlin, who I'll be talking about later, is a person who left her Quaker congregations or meetings uh, and became a Wesleyan Methodist as well. Joseph Mallory reached Sharon Hollow in 1838. He stayed with the Gillets through the winter months and then continued on to Canada with a new name, Lewis Hill. Gillett has built his sawmill several years earlier at the site of the existing Sharon Mills. Later, Gillett would build a grist mill at the same site. <clears throat> Amasa Gillick continued his anti-slavery activities, gathering signatures and sending petitions to Congress uh, opposing legal slavery. Unfortunately, Congress had passed a gag order, so the petitions about slavery were su suppressed. It was reported that the petitions were tossed on the floor and never shown to any legislators. You can see here, Amasa Gillett um, found and obtained the uh, signatures of at least 51 other people in Washtenaw County. And just imagine at that time, how sparsely populated the area was, especially out where he was in a rural area and how hard it would have been to gather all those signatures, all that work and sending in uh, these petitions only to have them thrown away on the floor.
Amasa Gillett died in 1854. He led a full life raising many children, expanding his farm to over 1,000 acres and fighting to end American slavery. As a citizen, Gillett was highly regarded and elected as a county supervisor and justice of peace. He is buried at the crossroads of Sharon Valley and Sharon Hollow Roads. We know little about Lewis Hill, except that he uh, did go to Canada and there he was free. And we have no idea at this point um, what happened to him afterwards. By 1840, several underground railroad networks crisscrossed the lower peninsula of Michigan. This is a later map showing how lines of assistance zigzagged and connected in the general direction of Detroit and Canada. Places were connected by steam powered boats, railroads and telegraphs. People escaping slavery and those assisting used every mode of travel to stay ahead of those profiting from selling husbands, wives and sometimes their own children. As you can see on the map, um, there were many different networks. There were many different places. There was no set route. There were no set lines and people communicated with each other or sent people on to safe places uh, that they believed um, would provide sanctuary for somebody. And now we get to the story of John Felix White, who had been enslaved in Kentucky for 25 years when he learned that he would be sold in the New Orleans slave market. White had a wife and several children. They faced a likely permanent separation, whether he was sold away or escaped to freedom. White chose escaping to freedom. He crossed the Ohio River to Rising Sun, Indiana. He was protected by the Berkshires. They were African-Americans who helped people escaping on both sides of the Ohio River. They directed White north to the home of Quakers, Levi and Catherine Coffin in Newport, Indiana. The Coffins had been helping self-emancipators for over a decade. White stayed for several weeks, wanting to go back to rescue his family while he was still being pursued. John White experienced cruelty and physical abuse while in bondage and truly feared for the welfare of his loved ones. Coffin finally convinced him to continue on to Canada, stopping with Laura Smith Haviland in Michigan. Laura Smith Haviland was a key figure in transnational interracial networks of escape. She provided leaseholds on her farm and welcomed students of any race or gender to her school, the Haviland Institute. Her farm in Raisin Township, Lenaway County was just north of Adrian and a busy stop on the Underground Railroad. John Felix White stayed briefly at the Haviland farm and then continued on to Canada. Within a short time, he returned to Haviland's place. White was determined to rescue his family, but it was impossible during the winter months. So he attended school and earned the education that had been denied him during bondage. You can note on this uh, map, the Underground Railroad sites that intersected around Adrian. Adrian is in the lower portion of this circle. And if you go north, um, you will see Tecumseh that we'll be talking about later. And further from that is Manchester, Sharon, and just to the left, the Watkins Farm and Brooklyn uh, west of that. As soon as the weather improved, White returned to Coffin's home in Indiana, 300 miles distant, to plan a rescue of his family. From there, he went east to Cincinnati, spending months searching and begging for a boat and assistance. Defeated, White was forced to return to Michigan. He stayed on at the Haviland Farm, again attending school. In 1847, White moved to the thousand acre farm 
of Royal and Sally Watkins, his earnings would finance a well-planned trip to the Ohio River. The Watkins farm straddled Washtenaw and Jackson counties and lay only five miles north of Lenaway County. John Felix White had been working at the Watkins farm for months and somehow communicated with his wife in Kentucky. Michiganders were alert for threats from slave hunters after several kidnapping attempts throughout 1847. A stranger appeared, appeared in Southeast Michigan late fall, first at the farm of Laura Haviland. Within days, neighbors learned George Washington Brasher traveled from Kentucky to kidnap John White, the man he had intended to sell in New Orleans. Brasher stopped at a saloon in Manchester to hire some local scoundrels to round out his posse of armed men. Next, they hired a carriage and set off for Watkins Farm. Brasher and his men spied a distant field where a lone man toiled. The seven abductors surrounded the worker, weapons drawn, they closed in and grabbed him. It was not John White. Brasher went to Watkins' farmhouse and confronted Watkins. Brasher blamed Laura Haviland, but Royal Watkins told the Kentuckian that he would do as much to help a self freed man as Haviland. And he said that he had heard the rumors about the search for John White and had put him on a train bound for Canada the previous day. The following day, Brasher and his men met in nearby Tecumseh, where they were overheard threatening Laura Haviland and discussing options to take revenge and capture their so-called human property. Finally, at the end of the day, the men left for Toledo where they took the train south. John White refused to forsake his loved ones enslaved in Kentucky. First, he convinced Laura Haviland to go to Boone County, Kentucky to meet him with his wife to persuade her to meet him at the Ohio River at night. Haviland risked her life going to Kentucky where a federal warrant was out for her arrest. If caught, she could have been jailed or hanged as a slave stealer. White's wife was unable to get away and Haviland had to return home without the family. <clears throat> In the fall of 1848, White planned a new rescue of his family. Jane and the children were able to get to the river while he waited on the other side. Suddenly, the family was chased down as they were carried back into bondage, John White listened to the screams of Jane and the children, Oscar, George, Emily Francis, Cicely, and Lucy Ann. He could do nothing. He hid in the woods for two weeks as the search was on for him. Finally realizing it would not be possible to rescue his family, John White began his trek north. However, he was caught by Sheriff Wright Ray of Madison, Indiana and placed in jail. White gave a false name and then wrote to Royal Watkins asking him to ask Haviland to raise money for his release. Laura. Haviland left immediately to see Levi Coffin in his new home in Cincinnati, Ohio. They managed to raise money and sent a trusted ally to liberate White from jail. John White returned North heartbroken and defeated. Famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote in his newspaper about the case and asked for donations to repay Haviland's loan. You can see here where he tells the story in his newspaper. John White settled in Sandwich, 
Ontario, resigned to creating a new life for himself. This newspaper article lists his name as a member of the Anti-Slavery Executive Committee. As you can see here, Henry Bibb was the president of this organization. Henry Bibb had been a very important person in Michigan for having enslaved and then joined the um, lecture circuit going around with prominent abolitionists telling the story of his life in slavery and how freedom felt to him. And it helped raise funds for those people attempting to escape and those who had escaped and were making a new life in Canada. Also, this newspaper article shows another member of the executive committee. Her name was Mary Reynolds. Mary Jane Reynolds would become John White's wife on December 8, 1852. He found a new life for himself and a new family in Canada. The Whites farmed a 50 acre parcel for about a decade. Around 1858, the family moved to Farmington, Michigan area. <clears throat> Um, John White was still considered a fugitive from slavery at this time. This is before the Civil War and Emancipation, and he was still listed as a fugitive, so-called fugitive from slavery. However, um, at that time, Michigan had become much more tolerant of uh, abolitionism, and public opinion generally had changed so that people were unhappy with uh, what was happening in the South uh, with enslavement becoming harsher and harsher and not wanting to have uh, people forced to, slay, uh, to flee to have a life for themselves. Uh, many communities by this time in Michigan uh, were willing to protect their African-American neighbors if they chose to leave Canada. Many people crossed back and forth from Canada to Detroit, sometimes uh, to be married, sometimes for work. There was a great deal of um, communication on both sides of the Detroit River. Soon after the White family uh, left Farmington, Michigan and moved to the Ann Arbor area, excuse me, to Ann Arbor, where there were integrated schools for the youngest of the Whites' six children. <clears throat> White's home was in the neighborhood where the anti-slavery newspaper had been published and activists participated in, the, in helping freedom seekers from the 1830s. This is the lower town area of Ann Arbor and the Signal of Liberty was published not far from his home. Um, and his home was actually on the same street as uh, Reverend Guy Beckley's home, Pontiac Trail, uh, where um, Guy Beckley also had helped people and offered shelter in his home. Um, John White died in 1905, and he is buried in Fairview Cemetery, only a few blocks from his former home. His wife and children in Kentucky had attempted to escape again. Jane White was separated from her children and then they were sold. After the Civil War, Jane advertised for her children and reunited with all but one of them. A descendant of John White, uh, who I've spoken to, said that some of his Canadian children met their Kentucky half siblings later in life, and even moved to be near them in Colorado. And George Washington Brasher, the man who was the slave trader, he took some cargo to New Orleans during a cholera outbreak in 1849. He caught the disease and died.
So on this screen, you will see some names of different organizations. The National Park Service, US Department of the Interior, National Park Service, I should say, has um, a special uh, department that offers a listing and keeps a list of uh, underground railroad sites, um, programs and tours across the United States. And we have several places that I'm going to show on the next page that are part of this uh, National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. We also have in the state of Michigan, the Michigan Freedom Trail. Both of these uh, lists require very um, good documentation to prove that these sites were in fact part of the Underground Railroad, the participants were part of it. Um, so it is a great honor to be listed on these sites. The Watkins Lake State Park and County Preserve is, um, as I showed before, is in Brooklyn, Michigan. Um, that's the address for it, but it straddles the, the two counties and is very close, in fact, to the Sharon Mills. Not very far, a couple of miles, a few miles. Um, and that is now listed in the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom and the Michigan Freedom Trail listing. Also, John White's burial site in Fairview Cemetery is in Ann Arbor. As I said, it's just one block off of Pontiac Trail. And that is where John White uh, and other family members are buried. And that too is listed on both of the um, sites, uh, the national site and the state site. <clears throat> so we have this two sites associated um, with uh, Watkins Farm and uh, we don't have anything listed so far with Amasa Gillett and um, Lewis escaping. So um, there are there is an opportunity here to perhaps list those sites as well. And of course, the listing is an opportunity to share this important history, this significant history with other people, whether it's through tours or programs. So some of the sites that are already listed in Washington County um, are shown here. In addition, there are um, tours and programs and archives that can be listed and already are. Um, so um, it is, as you can see, one of these sites is the um, John Lowry burial site. And then of course we had the John Felix White burial site. So we, it is possible to list the Gillett burial site, but it might also be possible to um, list Sharon Mills itself if there is enough signage or um, educational programming that, that tells the story of Joseph Mar Mallory Lewis Hill escaping and how he was helped uh, by the Gillett family and stayed over for a period of time. Another way for us to uh, learn more about these stories is by um, considering taking the Journey to Freedom tours that are offered by the African American Museum of Washtenaw County. Um, their website and phone number are listed here. Um, there are also books, I put mine on here. Uh, <laughs> And I wrote a chapter for Fluid Frontier too. Um, but there are other books that um, take in the, a wider area in the country uh, and a couple others that deal with um, Michigan. Um, but I think that of course, um, I believe that it's very important that we recognize uh, Lewis Hill and John Felix White for their bravery, their determination and their fortitude I mean, I know it's hard for all of us to imagine the brutal conditions that they may have suffered and the pain of leaving home and their loved ones behind, but I think that their stories are very important to share. Um, I think that um, if you take 
one of the tours in the journey to freedom. Uh, there are tours of Ann Arbor and there are tours of Ypsilanti. They will, um, the tours of Ann Arbor will talk about um, perhaps both of the sites, but generally they will definitely talk about Lewis Hill. I mean, excuse me, about John Felix White because of his burial site being uh, there as part of the tour now. Uh, and you can learn more about all the other sites. So I have plenty of time for questions and I look forward to um, hearing what they are. And I thank you very much for your attention. Um, so give me your questions, thank you. The questions are open, so I don't have any right now, Carol, but thank you for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I will tell you something more about how I came up with a lot of this information I just shared with you because I, I mean, it, it's taken me years and years to learn this information. Um, and one of the ways that I came up with more information about <clears throat> John Felix White's family was because I was, um, I was nominating the site, um, Watkins Farm, and in doing so, I learned that um, I, I was trying to find out more about what happened to him afterwards. And so I, I did some online searches and his name came up on a site um, in Boone County. Uh, the Boone County Public Library had researchers uh, begin a special um, project to document all the anti-slavery activity in their area and learn as much as they could about all the people who had escaped to freedom uh, from that county and that area. And so when I went onto that site and I communicated with the researchers, I learned all of this about his first family from Kentucky because I didn't know anything about them before. So um, it's very possible to continue to add to this history. It's never going to stay still. We're always going to be adding more and more as more and more things are being digitized. And I think it's so important to try to um, learn the full story of these people who came from such difficult beginnings and overcame so much of their trauma uh, of early life and found new lives in freedom. Okay, any questions now? Yes, I had a couple oh, questions come in. Um, there was a couple questions about Watkins home right now as it relates to this. Um, I think questions about the exact location and then future of you know any efforts there with, or is it related to the Watkins home? That's an excellent question. I showed a picture of the house, but unfortunately the house is not part of the Washtenaw County um, preserve and um, the rest of it is. And of course the rest is what really matters because that's where uh, White was almost kidnapped was from the field, not the house itself. Um, so the house is not included. The house is actually in disrepair and I, I'm hoping that somebody will, <clears throat> well, the owner will actually take it upon himself to try to restore it, uh, rehabilitate it. Um, so the, Park itself is um, managed by the Parks Department, obviously, and the state, and it is open for tours and they have events and they have the website, um, the Parks Department website, and you can go on there and learn uh, about all the events that are taking place out there. Um, there are walking trails, there are lakes, um, beautiful bird sighting area, and um, in the future, there will be a lot of development, um, educational types of development, uh, signage and such about the history of the site. Thanks, Carol. There's another question here about, um, are there any other stories about Underground Railroad sites that you've uncovered in maybe the Dexter area or perhaps in other in the Manchester area? Um, well, yes, um, in Dexter, um, 
I've been working for a very long time trying to find more about Sam O'Dexter's participation in the Underground Railroad. And I just came across something a couple months ago <clears throat> and I have to locate where I put it in my files, but I have tried for you know, decades to learn more that we could not, so that we could nominate that site. And so far, um, when I communicate with people about Dexter's house, there wasn't enough there so far to be able to get it listed. And, um, but we do have other sites that could be listed. Um, unfortunately, Theodore Foster's house was in what was called Sio, but that's the same area. And um, the house is gone. Uh, and he ended up being buried somewhere else. But the site can still, you don't have to have a house on it. The, the rules are quite different for Underground Railroad listings. Um, and so the site, if it had a sign, it could be listed as a site that this was where Theodore Foster actually had somebody hiding in his basement um, who was discovered by the neighborhood children. So there are several sites and um, as well, um, I think the church, had a minister um, who was involved. Um, and then in Manchester, um, sorry, hard off the top of my head <laughs> to think of all of them. There were people who were known abolitionists, but to tie somebody uh, directly to the Underground Railroad is a different person. I have several people from Manchester that I know of that um, if, somebody delved very, very closely into their complete life and found diaries or more papers, uh, they might be able to be listed, but it, it takes a, a lot of work for each individual to research. Thank you. There's a, yep, there's a question on here about, you know, just really kind of to what you're saying, it's gotta be pretty hard to get information about freedom seekers because wouldn't they need to keep their identity secret while escaping? And how did you go about uncovering all of this information? Um, it is true, but fortunately, as I showed in my uh, presentation earlier, that um, the, the paper that was written by Dr. Nathan Thomas, when he talked about um, a mass of gillets, you know, being part of the Underground Railroad, and he mentioned William Sullivan, he went on to name um, other people. Now, he was, his report came in the 1880s. And another person who uh, became part of a network that he was included on um, in Battle Creek also in his later years wrote uh, naming people that he knew of that were part of uh, his network. Um, Laura Havland wrote a book. She didn't really name um, very many people, unfortunately, in her book, Levi Coffin also wrote a book. Um, so these gave us names and starting places. County histories have been very good for uh, naming if a person was an abolitionist and then um, finding if they subscribe to the Signal of Liberty newspaper, if they um, ran on the Liberty Party ticket, that was the anti-slavery national uh, political party, um, things like that. And the good news is that uh, so much more is being digitized so now people are even putting up family Bibles or, and family genealogies and, and you can find sometimes in those where the family would have written something down. Um, the Signal of Liberty newspaper is available for anyone to see on the Ann Arbor District Library web pages. We had another question in here about um, Royal Watkins, and they had a, this um, question was asked by someone who had attended another presentation about Watkins Lake State Park and County Preserve. Um, there, I think at that time it was mentioned Royal Watkins was one of the only private railway stops in Michigan due to the amount of land that he had owned. Is that true? And um, did this contribute to his ability to participate in the Underground Railroad? Uh, it is true. And I did a lot of research on Royal Watkins and I got very fortunate because I found a descendant who shared with me family papers. I wish that there had been time back then to have gone through all of the whole box of papers. Um, but in those, there were um, articles that 
also mentioned from an early day that mentioned his anti-slavery activities. Um, so uh, that was that was helpful. It, it is true about the railway being there. He ended up with, I believe, two thousand acres of land. Um, as I said before, it crossed over to another county. It was such a massive estate and uh, passed down through his children until, you know, if for generations and generations. Um, so that, um, I think that he probably, um, he could have been helping people early on. He was a, a strong anti-slavery advocate. And I found that information about him in a, a county history from where he came from. So I looked up, you know, their history, where he came from um, back East. And I found there a description of how he uh, chose as his religion to be a covenanter. And they believed very much in individual freedoms. And so he believed that it didn't make no difference what color of skin a person had, that they were entitled to equal rights under God. And so he um, fulfilled his mission of his um, religious beliefs of helping in that regard. And then do you know where Royal Watkins is buried? Is it on the property or is it another location? No, he's buried in the cemetery. Up to, oh, shoot, I can't remember the name of it. In, I think, Manchester or nearby. In Manchester, I think. I think there are a couple of them. I can't remember the name of it, but yes, it's a big cemetery. Um, just a couple, couple last few questions here, Carol. Thank you for <laughs> answering. Oh, all I of love these. answering questions. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a, a rough number on how many people came through the Underground Railroad in this area? No. <laughs> 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 I, um, you know, it. I would say definitely in thousands because um, Levi Coffin said he had helped 2,000 people. And that was when he was still in Indiana and hadn't even moved to Cincinnati yet. Um, there would have been thousands, uh, but whether they were just this area, I don't know. I mean, people, many people came up on the Western side, they came up through Indiana and then crossed over. And in the Cass County area, Michigan, there was a very large settlement of Quakers that invited African-Americans to settle. And so there were hundreds who settled there. Um, I'd say definitely the thousands because there were places that, were, that had been passed down as being known to help people. Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti and um, Detroit were well known um, and Pittsfield Township had a, a strong group. Um, so they were well known for helping and the word got back. Okay, and then I think one last question. Um, the question for you is, have you seen some of the secret code writing of Theodore Foster at the Bentley Historical Library? And if so, <sighs> do you have any thoughts about it? It looks as though he was communicating about fugitives. Well, Okay, it's not secret code writing. It is, um, yes, I came across that back when I was doing the research for writing my book. Um, it is shorthand. And it was a kind of shorthand that was very popular back in the 1800s when he was writing, he was going to write a book and did not end up publishing something. So he wrote in shorthand, but he also ended up writing out what he wrote. So I, I think that they're probably, that they correspond closely to each other. Um, and so I did read everything that he wrote in longhand. And I did try, <clears throat> actually the African-American Museum members, there were a couple and I, we tried to get somebody to uh, transcribe the shorthand, but we couldn't find anybody who still could do that shorthand and especially do it for nothing. Um, so we didn't do it, but I, I really feel that, um, that it was just a shorthand for what he ended up writing or um, his notes that are available in English that you can read. And then speaking of your book, you talk a lot, do you talk about other cities like Lansing, Flint, or Monroe? 
Yes, but I definitely concentrated more in this area because this is where I'm from. And it was a lot easier for me to get my hands on documents uh, because back when I was doing the research for this, there wasn't very much online. So I had to just spend most of my time at the Bentley Historical Library. And I went to Ohio and you know, other, I went to Canada. I, I went other places to try to look at their archives as well. And um, I went to other cities. I did a project in Flint. And then I recently did a project in Monroe. Um, but that didn't, that isn't in my book. It was done later. But of course, those, the information that I did have at the time for uh, those areas is anything I did have is in the book. But it was written in 2010. So uh, published in 2010. So I have amassed, excuse me, amassed, I have amassed <laughs> more information <laughs> since then. Well, Carol, thank you for your time. Those are the, most of the questions and lots of thank yous are coming in for you and your time and doing the presentation. You're so welcome. And I hope that people will uh, go online and learn more about this and take a tour from the Journey to Freedom Tours. They're very well done. And um, thank you very much for everybody who tuned in. Thank you, everyone.